Okay, NSA. Uh, first of all, I'd like to apologize about the questionnaire I sent out. I had 62 responses, but unfortunately, uh, SurveyMonkey only let me get 10 of the responses unless I paid them $100. Ah, ah. That, that was the fine print of using the free edition of SurveyMonkey, which I guess I, I should have put my uh, fine glasses on to read it. But anyway, I appreciate y'all. The, the good news is there were only four questions. So anyway, with that, let me go ahead and uh, start the presentation here on antennas and um, let's see I'll continue share are we connected here John yes okay so my when John called me he said can you give a presentation on antennas well that's pretty broad subject uh, you know you got FM antennas and all these other types of antennas, but I thought we'd focus on antennas based on where you live. Because for me, for the past 40 years of my hamming, it's always been an issue um, about where I, my QTH was, apartment, uh, you know, uh, a house without, con without HOAs and stuff. So this is how I'm gonna structure my presentation. So as you see here, uh, the QTH on this picture is field day. So anything goes for field day. And we got uh, a beam up here that we're, we're trying to set up. So let me see. Oh, so how come it's not moving? Um, just, just click on it with your mouse so that'll get it to be the, the active application. There we go, okay. All right, so the first antenna is based on a large lot. So you have no restrictions here. There's nobody to bother you with saying your, your, your antennas look lousy or you know, you're ruining my, my home location, whatever. The next one is antennas for limited spaces mm -hmm. and C CCNR communities, which means you have restrictions mm -hmm. on what you can erect. Um, and then the last part of my presentation is going to be apartments, condos, and hotels. So when I sent out the questionnaire, I was hoping to gather how many people live where so I could kind of focus my presentation. But uh, as I said, it did not work out. So I'm just going to cover it all. So the first, the first antennas I want to talk about are folks that can set up a tower and beams. Uh, and also wire antennas that are pretty long, like 80 meters and 160. So re regarding the beams, uh, the best thing about the beams is that they have gain. So for example, if you have a 100 watt uh, transmitter, you're gonna put out with a three element beam with, uh, with maybe eight dB gain, probably around 600 watts plus, depending on how many elements are your antenna. So, you know, you could say, well, gee, I don't even need an amplifier because I've got all that gain on a, on a beam, which, which is true. You could also pull out weak signals. You're focusing all this antenna uh, as a focused antenna and you're pulling out the weak signals as well as transmitting a stronger signal than you would uh, normally. They're also directional. So you can focus on where the signals are. For example, if you're trying to work uh, a station down in the Antarctica, you're gonna point it south and uh, hopefully he'll hear you. And being directional, it also has what they call a front to back ratio, which means you're gonna null out anything in the back of the, or the side of the beam. So that helps out, especially if you're in a contest and you're trying to focus on one part of the, uh, the globe. Uh, beams are best for chasing DX, working contest, and also if you have a, reli you have a reliable schedule, for example, you talk to a group every, every weekend and they know that your signal is gonna get, uh, get out. Some of the constraints though of uh, beams are is that uh, they're mostly relegated to six meters to about 40 meters. 
and 40 meters is pretty large beam. I, I had one and uh, I uh, was kind of sorry I did because the thing almost toppled my, my tower over so big. <laughs> uh, and on this picture, you can see this guy has a three element. Is my arrow showing on screen also? Yes. Okay. Yes. So you can, you can see this station KE5EE which is a uh, super station here. He's got three element 80 meter Yagi, which is huge, okay? That is tremendous. Uh, he's also got uh, a stepper antenna, 60 meter inverted V, a rotating tower, and uh, he's got 160 meter uh, towers back here on the side here. So he's got lots of property. Lots of money, obviously, because he has 10 towers and he's put over a million dollars into his antennas. Bank. Yeah. So my next point was the insulation is expensive and the maintenance of these things are also expensive. Um, so that's that's the best of the best here. You're looking at KE5EE and you can go to his website. He's a lot, got, he has a great website with lots of good information about his insulation. All right. So. Then we're gonna talk about types of beams. Um, this is a log on the left side is the log periodic that uh, our club set up at W4UVA. That's the University of Virginia station. And log periodic, the advantage here is that it covers many, many bands, uh, but it's, it is not, uh, as direct, is not as directional or has the gain, let's say a three element beam, but it is very versatile and uh, the military uses these a lot. When I was in Vietnam, these were on top of a lot of the consulates. And uh, I think I showed you a picture of that when I did my presentation on visiting Vietnam. But uh, the consulates like these because they can cover a lot of frequencies. And then on the right is yours truly uh, helping to set up our field day hex beam, which is also a pretty versatile antenna. And this beam covers, uh, I think it's 10 through 20. Is that right, Ed? Yes. Yeah, 10, 10 through 20. And um, it's an unusual looking antenna, but it is pretty high performing uh, if, uh, if you get it set up right. And of course here we've only got it up, uh, I think maybe we got it up at 20 feet, which was, which was pretty good, but uh, optimally you want to get this thing up 50 or 60 feet if you can. Uh, any questions? You know, the UVA antennas up over 70 feet. Oh, I didn't realize the tower went up that. See, you, yeah. you, can, you can see this is a fold down. This is folded down right now and it get, goes up pretty high. So 70 feet, that's, that's really good. Any questions on these two types of antennas? Okay. All right, then uh, Bob recently set up his antenna and sent me some photos here. So you can see setting these things up is, is not for the faint of heart. Uh, and Bob has got a Yagi antenna. And how many elements in this, Bob? Oh, I think if I recall correctly, I think it's nine. And actually, it's a combination Yagi log periodic. Oh, it, so oh OK. You see all of those elements in, uh, in the front that are all bunched together. Those are each driven elements. Uh, there's a, a one for six meters, 10 meters. 12, 15, 17, and 20. Very and cool. it works like a monobander on 10, 15, and 20. And the rest of the bands, it works like a, like a you know, log periodic. Very nice. And, and that, is, that is not me up there on the tower that's done this. <laughs> I was going to ask, who, who's the brave soul up there? <laughs> so um, setting these things up is, like I said, not for the faint of heart. And on the far right, you can see the junction box that Bob has got all these uh, antenna elements connected to, and uh, that is a very important part of the antenna setup here for this, this kind of setup. And um, I'm sure that was not easy getting that all together, Bob. Uh, we have a question. Is there a question? Yeah. Um, how, how do you not have that box explode when you put all the wires together? Actually, the the, uh, uh, the fellow that helped me put that box together at the old location where we just had one antenna out there said he didn't think that I could fit all those wires in there because 
I'm using the LMR 400 Flex. So that's a rather stiff uh, uh, cable, but we managed to make that uh, work. Uh, there's another picture that, uh, which I didn't send you, Dennis, that space is wide enough for two boxes. So I mounted this box off to the left, figuring that I might have to mount a second box off to the right, but it all fit, but there ain't gonna be anything else in that box because there's no more room. Right, uh, I think her question was related to uh, the electricity folding through. I think the only electricity is for the rotor, is that correct? Right, so the, the metal, uh, the, where you see the, uh, the wires, the, the, uh, the, yeah, that stuff, is that so that's really where the rotator uh, cables uh, are connected to ground. This is all connected to ground. And each of these devices that are out there are essentially uh, some form of lightning arrester. So, at which, so the idea is that if, if lightning should hit the tower, uh, it's going to go to ground somewhere near the tower and rather than following the cables into the shack. So that, that's the plan. That answer your question? Okay, good question though. No. Yeah, I could see where yeah. you yeah, Yep. All right, well, thank you, Bob. And uh, good luck with your setup there. Thank you. Um, so also having a large piece of property, you can put very long pieces of wire antennas up. And I'm talking about 80 and 160 meter wire antennas, arrays and all that kind of stuff. The issue with wire antennas is you need some kind of support uh, they're very inexpensive to purchase, uh, easy to build, easy to feed with coax. They have good red, uh, radiation patterns, although they're not as directional as the beams that we just talked about. And in most cases, you do need a tutor unless they're monobanders. But uh, many of these long wire antennas are able to, uh, to work on different bands here. So the basic dipole if uh, recall, is, is calculated by dividing the frequency by 400, uh, 468 by the frequency. So for 10 meters, you only need uh, a 16 foot piece of wire. Unfortunately, 10 meters is not the optimum band to be on right now. So going down the scale here. Dennis, that's, ch Dennis, that's changing. Oh, uh, oh, 10, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you, you can, but I'm just saying that uh, for, for good communication all around, uh, 10 meters is, is coming back, but not, uh, not as good as the other bands here. So 15 is kind of like 10, it's open and closed, and that's only about 22 feet. 20 meters is probably one of the better bands today, and you need 33 feet of wire. Now, and why did you leave off 17 meters? Um, I, I left off the, um, I left off the work bands, but, uh, because I didn't want to, this is a lot of stuff here. So anyway, uh, you could just calculate that by dividing, uh, in, into, uh, 468, the frequency, which would be 10 or, uh, 18 point whatever into 468. I just, I would try to explain uh, how much property that you would need if you wanted to work 160, 260 feet of wire is a lot of wire. So you're probably going to have to have uh, at least an acre of property here. So that's the basic dipole, just a piece of wire. Uh, and you, it's, it's basically half, half the, so on 10 meters, for example, eight feet would be here. And the other eight feet would be there with an insulator on each end. And then you would feed it with the ballon uh, right down to your to your uh, your radio. So that's your yeah, basic. Dennis. Diet. Yes. I want to add a couple of comments if you don't mind. Sure. There, there's people who have eighth acre city lots and loaded antennas, and they've worked the DXCC on 160 meters. So you could on any lot you could shoehorn in a large antenna, you might have to bend the wire. Right, right. I'm, I'm talking about uh, the length right, of the dipole right here. Also, Jim, Owen, and I, could you go back up? We highly recommend on a stim simple dipole not using a ballon. It destroys the SWR. 
because the one-to-one -one balance are not really one-to-one -one balance. Right, you could just hook it up to one part of the feed line on one side right. of the insulator and the other side. Yes, I, I've done that and it works fine, sure. All right, uh, so the next type, the next wire antenna is one that our antenna team uh, recommends and they put this in a lot of folks places and it's called the off center fed dipole. And it's by the name it means that this is not cut in half. You have one, one part of it is, is not the same length as the other. So you got eight for this particular antenna, 10 through 80 meters, you got 83 feet on one side and 46 feet approximately on the other. Um, and uh, Ed, do you recommend a ballon for this one? Well, this you have one, like, I'm gonna have to jump in again. Yeah. It's a four to one ballon, you must have a ballon in this case. But I have an off center fed dipole and without a tuner, the SWR is below two to one on most bands. That's that's very good. Yeah, but uh, the I trick think... is one thing these antennas need to be to get a decent SWR and to work out should really be 40, 50, 60, 70 feet in the air. Yes. So height above ground impacts the standing wave ratio and the performance. It, it does, definitely. Um, the only thing about this antenna, I think. Ed, it, you can't work 15 meters, is that correct? They will not work on 15, correct. Yeah, right. But uh, the rest of the bands, including the including the work bands, uh, will work fine. And I think you're probably going to need a tuner on some of those work, work bands or not. Dennis, I think yes. for some of these newer ones, you need to identify what the work bands are. Oh, OK. So the work bands are 30 meters. Uh, 17 meters and uh, 24 meters. 12 meters. 12 meters. 12, uh, 12 meters. I mean, yeah. World World Administrative Radio Conference of 19 and 70. Yeah, what? 78, I think. 78, when they gave us those bands. Right. Yeah. That's why they're known as the warp bands. They were given at that point. Yeah, not warp. I, I when I was <laughs> when I first when I first heard heard about them, I thought, what do you mean warp? Warp speed. I was into uh, what was that space uh, space. The, the majority of hams who operate seventeen and twelve meters do not run beams, and that's why it's a band I recommend. Well, I run a beam. Okay, I do too. Am I not normal? Oh, answer that. But the, the point is, you always want to operate as close to the maximum usable frequency as possible. So when 20 meters is open, there's times 15 is dead, yet 17 is wide open. Right. The, the other, other benefit of the work bands is that you will not find contests going on on the work bands. Which is right. nice. Right. Um, so the other advantage of this antenna is it's relatively inexpensive. I think. I think the antenna team gets their, uh, what was it, Maxom or something? Mm -hmm. Where they get They're the under $100. Under $100. Shipping, right around 100 ships. So that's that's a pretty good uh, price there for a band, for an antenna that covers most of the bands here. Yeah, I might add, I, I have a Carolina Wyndham, which is a very similar antenna. It's, uh, I, the only difference is it has another one to one bellum about 22 feet down from the top ballon. And, and that will, will work the work bands as well if you have an antenna too. Right, right. right. Another, another option is if you don't have enough space is to use an inverted V, uh, uses less space, and you only need one tree or support uh, for an inverted V. This one is mounted on, a, on the roof of a house and uh, it looks to be probably around 40 meter uh, 40 meters. So this is another option for setting up a wire antennas, inverted V. That looks like a fan dipole, actually. Uh, yeah, fan dipole. Yeah, it, it does. Yeah. All right. So I found the site. I was talking earlier about how many wire antennas oh, blew my mind. I can only show 200 and something on this chart. But if you go to this website, 
uh, Victor Alpha 3 India Uniform Lima. You can click on all these links and it'll show you the uh, configuration of these 400 plus wire antennas. <laughs> so I only covered uh, a few basic antennas and um, you are welcome to go to this website and see what the other 400 are about. So anyway, it kind of surprised me that there were so many. Um, all right, let's talk now about smaller lots and no trees. So here you, you can talk about verticals or in-fed antennas and some compromise antennas such as a crawl space antenna. Um, so vertical antennas, you've got three variations here. One is ground mounted and uh, the other one is mass mounted. And when am I going here? I can't see because, uh, oh, there we go. Mass mounted and you have mass mounted multi-band verticals which have coils in them and they operate different bands. The problem with some of the verticals is that they are very narrow frequency uh, operation, narrow bandwidth, which means if you want to work on sideband, uh, you, you can tune it for sideband, but if you need to work CW, which uh, is down at the bottom of the band, uh, you have to use a tuner. And uh, in some cases, you might even have to go back out to the antenna and, and rearrange the coils. But they are very efficient, especially if you have a small piece of property here. And let's see. I got some pictures from Steve, uh, K9, KN4 TKR. Are you here, Steve? Oh, he's not here. So he sent me a couple of pictures of this Kushcraft R9 that he purchased at the, uh, I guess it was a swap meet or something. And you can see on the, on the right how tall, this thing is, I think it's 33 feet tall. But the nice part is it goes straight up so you don't need much property to set this up. And it is multi-band. Um, I believe it covers all the bands, including the work bands. Yeah, 80 to 80 to 6. Yeah, so I was hoping he was going to be here to talk about his uh, antenna, but he sent me these pictures of his vertical. So thank you, thank you Steve. Welcome. Um, now, you might mention about radios versus elevated where you don't require as many radials. Right, well, that's, you can see the ground mounted, you can see the radials on the ground mounted antenna and the mass mounted antennas, uh, they, they could be trapped. Uh, of course, they, they could also use radials. But the one that uh, Steve set up, I, I don't think, I don't think he does have radials on that. But, is he here? Yeah, I'm. I'm here. Did you, yeah, uh, did that's. You put, uh, did this you put uses no. Up? Yeah, nope. this uses no radials. No radials. Okay, so there's yeah. there's variations on these verticals, which makes it nice. Um, so one of the variations here is called a flagpole antenna. Um, <laughs> they are not cheap. They run about a thousand dollars. Holy smoke! But but. If that's the only option, if you're in an HOA situation where you, you're not allowed to put antennas up, you can fly the flag and nobody will be the wiser. Um, they're saying these are HOA approved plus XYL, which means if your wife is fussy about antennas and towers, uh, she, she probably is not gonna say anything about you flying the flag. So, um, so these are all the benefits here. And this is from great, I think the company's called Grayline, but um, they claim that uh, five to 15 minutes to build it. But I think, I don't think you need the, I think you need some kind of foundation, which may be, yeah, yeah that, that's, uh, I could think that's deceiving to say it only takes five to 15 minutes to set this up. But that is an option if you are in a uh, confined, acreage there, meaning you have no acreage, which um, at Crozet, they are putting these homes up left and right and left and right next to each other, literally. So that flagpole may be an option. Any questions on, on these vertical antennas? Okay. Uh, another type of antenna that uses minimum space is, is called an end-fed antenna. And I've used these several times during field day. Um, 
because they only need one support and they cover several bands and uh, the, the feed line comes right from the end of the antenna. Um, so this, this particular end fed covers 80, 40, 30, 20, 17, 15, 12, and 10 meters. And they give the SWR readings here. So a lot of cases, you don't even need to, need to tune it with these types of antennas. However, it is, I think it's considered a compromise antenna, but is better than no antenna. Any questions on the NFED? All right, let's say you're in a condo, you might be, you know, going to a, some kind of seminar or class that lasts a couple of weeks, you want to take your radio, or you are in a condo in an apartment, you don't have an option, you're looking for, when we first moved here, we were in a apartment for nine months and our stuff was in storage. So what I did was hooked up to the gutters of the of the apartment and uh, I could tune it somewhat. <laughs> and uh, the other the other thing I did was operate it from my car as a mobile operation. So here's some ideas for cop for folks that live in this situation. You can have an antenna on your balcony. You can have a mag loop, stealth antennas, uh, like I just mentioned, gutter access, crawl space. If you have a crawl space, you can get to. You can use remote operation websites, mobile operation. Uh, you can just get out to your, in your car and go somewhere and operate. And one of my old friends used to use his air ducts. He was in a high rise and he actually was working DX with five watts using the air ducts. All right, so here's one antenna that I, I grabbed at, uh, at the uh, at Senior Ham Fest a couple of years ago, just because I wanted to try it. This is called a mag loop, and you could put this up on your balcony or you can pack it up and take it with you. Uh, the problem with this antenna is it does get out, but it's very, very narrow bandwidth. So for example, if you tune around plus or minus 10 KC, you have to retune the antenna here. Uh, they're very low noise, so you're, it's good for environments where you have a lot of noise. Um, and most of these, you can only operate uh, minimum wattage. You can't, you can't run a thousand watts into these things. So that's one of the drawbacks. I set mine up on a, on a photo tripod you can see here, and I was able to turn it around and work. And I did work, folks, with it. It does work, but it's again... Again, it's a compromised antenna. Um, here's, here's a fellow that set up his antenna on, in his crawl space up in his attic. Uh, and it's hanging by supports here in his attic. And it, these things do work. Um, I was reading about another guy who had a beam in his attic. It actually, he had enough room up there to turn a beam and he was working DX just fine. Um, and then here's, here's sort of a uh, exaggerated mobile setup, but if, uh, if there's a will, there's a way you can operate from your car with, uh, with verticals or a Yagi like this guy has. So all kinds of uh, ways to operate. And the other ways, if you can't get anything up, they do have remote sites that you can pay to uh, log in and operate. And I, I don't believe, uh, does anybody operate these? You, you can just use your computer and the microphone on your computer. And I guess you use the function buttons to, to be, transmit and not transmit. It's all set up at the station. So for example, this one in Tacoma, Washington, uh, they charge nine cents a minute. Uh, if you wanna operate, oh, that's, to, that's to receive only. If you wanna transmit, it's 39 cents a minute. And if you want to use the amplifier, it's 69 cents a minute. So it does look like it's a lot of money, but um, if you if you have to set up an antenna farm, something like this, I think you could say divide the cost of what that would be by how many minutes you would like to operate. And I wouldn't say this is this is for all around operating, but if you're in a pinch, let's say you're in a hotel or um, you're, um, you just can't operate 
for a certain reason somewhere, maybe in the hospital, who knows, you know, you're in the hospital for extended stay, you can still dial into these things and uh, operate like DX using these remote sites. So this one is called RHR Remote Ham Radio. Any, any questions about this kind of thing? You do need a computer, and I believe you can use your your smartphone with these. Has anybody tried it with a smartphone? No. no. Okay. All right. So that's I've, I've listened. I've I've listened uh, with a free app on smartphones, um, okay. and I guess there was some paid version that possibly you can transmit, but I I didn't get that far with it. But okay. it was amazing. You could you could actually select the transmitter around the country or around the world, right? And, right. and listen in. It was very cool. Yeah. Some of these are free. They're not as professionally well done, and the interface is cumbersome. But I've used a few of the free ones. Okay. Just for grins. Yeah, I think the thing with with these paid ones uh, is that you can reserve a time. Uh, as opposed to just kind of jumping in to see what what frequency or band is free, so I think for like for for operating contest, you can reserve the the site that you want, the antenna that you want, the transmitter, the whole works, and you you will pay dearly to do that, but it is available. So, all right. So the other option, if you're compromised with not being able to set up antennas, is you can go out to the field. And these folks here are working uh, uh, parks on the air and some folks, those summits on the air and there's a lot of sites and information about how these folks operate. But this is just a portable dipole they set up. Body pole. And the advantage here is you have no noise. I mean, they're out there in the country. You don't have any RF noise from computers or hash from these new type of LED light bulbs and anything. So. Uh, they are having fun, it looks like. Uh, let's talk a little bit about testing your antennas. You got all that work you put into testing it, and you want to see, does the thing get out? There's a system called the Reverse Beacon Network. Now, to use this, you have to send Morse code, and all you have to do is send your, your call sign. And you, I think anybody can learn to do that. You, don't, you can send it five words a minute. But this is this is one that I just used recently, and you can see where you can see that where it says 32 dB. So that was that was my uh, Carolina Winter antenna, and I used I've got three antennas, uh, all wire antennas. Carolina Windham for 80, one for 40, and then I've got a uh, a G5 RV. So I was testing to see which antenna was going to get out the the best here. So this one transmitted at, at 257. This one transmitted on this antenna at 258. This one transmitted also around 258. But by far the Carolina wind of on 80 meters, which operates on 20, by the way, it, it operates on all bands, uh, definitely got out much better in this case. So this is a good way you can test your antennas uh, or you want to try different antennas out, you can see which one gets out best. And this is called the Reverse Beacon Network. Um, another place that you can you another device that you can use is called Weak Signal Propagation Report. And on this one, I transmitted uh, with 100 milliwatts, which is one tenth of one watt. And this is sort of a roll up of what what my signal was getting out on 20 meters. You, I hit Australia, I hit New Zealand, I hit the Antarctic, tons of places in the States, of course, Hawaii over here, uh, and tons of places in Europe. Um, so this, this was testing my antenna over the course of uh, 24 hours, just to see uh, which antenna would get out best. And in this case, uh, one antenna was better on certain frequencies than another. So lots of ways you can test your antennas. This is just two ways that I uh, like to illustrate here. Any, any questions on, on this? Um, you, can't, you can't see my video right now, right? Yeah, we just, got it. 
you can see my yeah yes. yes all right so this is this is the little device i use for weak signal propagation reports i think it's about um i think it costs about 40 60 dollars or something and it transmits every it, it's sort of like ft8 it's a digital signal but it's kind of cool that you can with the software it will transmit every couple of minutes uh, if there's a if there's an opening. So uh, that's that is. Are you able to see it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So one end goes to the antenna, the other end goes to the um, to the radio, and uh, that's about it. Very simple. Uh, some of the other things you can use is to listen for beacons. Um, these beacons are set up all over the world. So here you've got one on the far left, it's in Hawaii. Then you've got one on the far right, that's Japan, another one in New Zealand. <clears throat> and they transmit once on each band every three minutes, 24 hours a day. So you can listen for these beacons to see for band openings or just to check which, let's say you have two antennas, a vertical and a wire antenna. You want to see which one you can hear the best. So beacons are good propagation tools. And this is on the NCDXF uh, project. And I'll send a link to this in the uh, presentation. Another thing you can do is uh, if you think that the antenna is not getting out is check your sunspot activity. For example, this one is telling you that uh, if, if you happen to be on 15 meters, 17 meters, that it's fair propagation. Uh, 12, 10 meters at this particular time or this day, it's going to be poor. So that doesn't mean your antenna is not performing. It just means that propagation is, is not good. All right. So for construction information, the ARRL has antenna books. There's a ton of YouTube videos, which I learned a lot from. Like I was going to buy an antenna and, and read a, uh, listened to a review on one and decided not to get it. So check out YouTube videos before you buy anything, uh, see what they say. And then of course, there's our AARC antenna team. So let me see if this link works. And there's Dave shooting up a line about what, 70 feet, Dave? Yeah, I think it was it was 50 or 60, 70 feet. I don't know. It was way up there. <laughs> so anyway, uh, our antenna team is uh, is great at helping you uh, get, answer questions and setting up antennas. We tend to recommend using RG8X, which is lightweight coax. Right. But it's for, otherwise these antennas, even with center support, will droop too much. So that, heavier coax. that concludes my presentation, gentlemen, and thank you for uh, listening. I think I, I think I was under by thirty minutes here. I think that was excellent, Dennis. Um, any questions? Uh, I know you were asking questions during the presentation, but uh, any other questions that may have come up? Okay, so I'm going to stop screen sharing. Just a comment, Dennis. Yes. The the guy who's always been my hero with the dipole antenna is uh, Scott Harwood, K4VWK down in Farmville. Oh, okay. And uh, Scott Scott uses a dipole. He doesn't cut it for the band. He cuts it for the frequency on the band that he's going to use. So he he uses a dipole antenna that's resonant absolutely on the frequency that he operates on very good and he has the best he has the best 80 meter signal around virginia it's just crazy wow thank you for that comment uh, any anybody else uh dennis i just wanted to add that uh during your presentation i don't know if anybody is following the the chat or not in the meeting but uh, I've been dropping in URLs uh, to the various websites that you've been uh, mentioning. Oh, great. So, uh, yeah. the, the, the one for all the wire antennas is there. Uh, I, I just put the uh, International Beacon Project is there. 
And I also, years ago, when I first started, well, not that long ago for most of you, <laughs> when I started getting into ham radio in a large state northwest of here, um, I, uh, I happened to follow this guy, Dave Tadlock, on YouTube. Uh, he makes a lot of wire antennas, and he has a YouTube channel called Zed, Zed's Workbench. And I dropped a link to his channel in the chat as well. He hasn't been as active as he once was, but, uh, but he's got some videos up there that are just really, really good of how to build, build uh, various antennas. And uh, he covers delta loops and, and regular dipoles and traps. And uh, I just strongly recommend uh, if anybody wants to, wants to see a few uh, good how to do it videos, uh, Zed Zed's workbench. So. Very good. Well, thank you. Thank you for getting those links, Bob. Yep. Dennis, what could you, that little whisper box, are you using it? What do you, I don't understand what's its purpose. All right. So this, this transmits, you, you have to have, first of all, you have to download the software, which is free. Okay. Uh, you have to buy this device and uh, when you, when you start the software, you pick the band that you want to transmit on. So, so in that particular case I was showing you, that was 20 meters and you can set how much power that you want to use. So I've, I've been using about hundred milliwatts, but I've gone down to five milliwatts uh, just, just to see, you know, which antenna is going to get out with the uh, least amount of signal. So my, my talk, I mean, there's so much stuff about antennas, like measuring. Uh, you know, I've got I've got this expensive uh, SWR meter. It does a ton of stuff to measure your antennas, setting up your antennas, slingshots, air guns. Uh, uh, the uh, there's one called Easy. I'm trying to think what the thing is. It, it's a Easy Hang. It's a, Easy. easy hang. Yeah, it's it's, it's a computer easy. program on on how these antennas work and the configuration, the polar patterns and all this stuff. There's a ton of stuff. So when when John said, can you talk about antennas? It was like, whoa. <laughs> um, so when so you I, test your whisper, yes. you're using that box. You're not using your transceiver. Correct. This box is a transmitter. It, it only transmits up to 200 milliwatts. And then, and then, it only covers, this particular one only covers uh, 20 meters and 30 meters. So I, I got this Torrids, these, these are, uh, this, this lets me operate on, um, let's see, it lets me operate on 40, 80, and 160. So these are um, filters that I can operate. I hook, I hook this up in between the this device and I can operate on these extra bands. So for example, 160, I was trying a quarter wave antenna on 160. I had no idea if the thing was gonna get out and I didn't wanna wait until the contest. So uh, I, I tried it out with this thing with 200 milliwatts and I, I found out I was getting out as far as the Midwest. I was getting no DX, so that particular quarter wave 160 antenna uh, wasn't wasn't that great, <laughs> but it it helps. I mean, I can't be here all day to test the frequency. So this is this is how this thing helps you. So it's it gives you a graph and says, okay, at three o'clock in the afternoon, this particular um, you, you're you're able to get out to Europe or you're able to get out to South America. Propagation is God. Okay, if there's no propagation, I don't care what kind of beam or tower you have, you're not gonna work anybody. So that's the first thing you do is look at sunspot activity and look at what bands are open. Um, the other thing are, are, you can look at are packet clusters and you can see all the guys that are operating each other on these packet clusters. I didn't, it's too much to cover here. So yeah. I, had to, I had to limit this, but- we could, we could, All right. So well, maybe, very much. maybe uh, you know, somebody else can pick this up and have another presentation. But uh, anyway, any other questions? All right.
Thank you, Mike. Another observation, I, I worked a guy one time in the Midwest who was using a liquid ion antenna. Okay. Mobile. So it was like, it was like a 10 foot length of PVC pipe filled with a salt solution. And I don't know how he fed it, but it worked real well. And he was, he was driving in rural Iowa, I think. And you know, <clears throat> the roads out there, they're, they're either north, south or they're east, west. And when right. he was on a north, south road, he was like 20 over. And when he turned and went east, west, he <laughs> dropped down to about S5. But it actually worked. It, it, was, a, it was a liquid antenna. So one, one quick uh, bait, uh, on that uh, topic there. Uh, we were at field day once and uh, we had a six meter set up and the guy on six meters maybe worked a handful of stations, a handful of stations during 24 hours. So this little, uh, looks like an HT, uh, but it's, it covers six meters, 40 meters and um, I think those are the two bands it covers. Anyway, I put an antenna on this thing, but maybe three feet tall. And as it was breaking down, I said, let's see if I can work anybody on six. And with two watts, I worked a station down in, I think, Alabama or Arkansas before he closed down the station, added that to his logbook with two watts and a three foot, uh, six meter antenna that was had a loaded coil on it. So going back to uh, Dave there, you can work anybody if there's provocation and with uh, very little wattage. So it, it was kind of fun to, to see the guy's expression when uh, I, I worked that guy. But that was, I had one six meter contact back, I don't know, 10 years ago, it must have been. Well, well thanks, Dennis. I yep. think we're going to wrap it up. Before we uh, open up the meeting to any additional comments and then eventually uh, close the meeting, Bob Romanko, I'm putting you on the spot. Could you chat a little bit about field day planning and what you need from the membership? Yeah, thank you. Uh, field day planning is going really well. Uh, totally stoked. Uh, of course, we have the location at the Earliesville Volunteer Fire Company. Uh, the, uh, the, the positions, field day, I, do, I don't really call it a committee per se. It is people who are willing to own various areas of responsibility. <laughs> uh, right now, uh, there are a total of 16 areas of responsibility in field day. Uh, I've been using these since I've been doing field day and it seems to be working pretty well. Um, currently of those 16 areas, we have 11 filled. And there's only five remaining. And uh, rather than opening that up at the meeting here, I'm going to, uh, there are some individuals I'm still working with for confirmation, but let it just be said that right now for field day, we're doing very, very, very well. Bob, are we operating three A, I believe? Yes, yes. We are going to continue on with three. Uh, three shall be the number. <laughs> plus the GOTA and, station. Yeah, plus the GOTA. Yeah, not two. Yeah, not four. And go to is get on the air for any new hams. Right. Where you could, even if you don't have a general, you could operate under the auspices of a. Now I will, I will tell you, I, I will say uh, there are, there are two positions that I could, uh, that I can announce tonight. Uh, well, one is, uh, uh, I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but uh well, right now we have the safety officer is open. So I, I need somebody to be a safety officer and I am willing to do the uh, night shift for safety officer. And uh, so you don't have to stay up all night. And uh, also, uh, but for, for now, that's the big one I need to fill is I need to fill the safety officer. Uh, if you check your chat for this meeting, there are a couple of me people that I have actually talked to during the meeting. <laughs> so if you saw me uh, chat with you and you're able to do anything that I asked you, uh, please just reply back in the chat if you'd like. And, uh, and I'd appreciate that. But um, safety officer is the biggie. Uh, if anybody wants, that's, that's the one we, 
really need to have uh, the, the highest priority one to fill right now. It sounds like Steve Hall might be a good candidate. Huh? Hey, Bob, <laughs> uh, Rich, I'll take that welcome table. Oh, good. Okay. Okay. We're filling up quick. Rich, you are so, you are an unbelievably great ambassador for our club. Uh, what a blessing. Thank you so much. So.